welcome to this second webinar as we build up to our first live event in Riyadh on the 7th of November. Today we're going to be talking about international investment trends. Uh, the booming economy in Saudi is creating huge opportunity for foreign investors. We're going to navigate some of the opportunities and challenges through the course of this conversation. We're also going to be talk about outbound investment, particularly into the UK and the type of investments that Saudi families are interested in making. Um, I'm joined by three esteemed panellists um, who we're going to talk to over the course of the next hour. As always, with our content, we enjoy questions and comments uh, from the floor. I'm going to be looking across the chat and Q&A, and I'll bring your questions and comments and thoughts to our panellists as we move through. Um, but I would like to welcome to this session our three speakers, uh, Amgad Hussain from Harani and Partners in Withers. Uh, uh, sorry, Amgad Hussain from Harani and Partners in Riyadh, Hussain Hairi uh, from Withers in London, and also Mark Brooks from Mark Brooks Education. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for having us. Brilliant. So, uh, Amgad, uh, first of all, it'd be great to hear a little bit about your practice in Riyadh and the type of clients uh, you help from Saudi. Yes, um, you know, our practice in Saudi Arabia is we are a full service law firm um, representing, and we've been on the ground for over 40 years in, in the region. Um, we have offices in Riyadh, Jeddah, and Al Khobar. So we are in the three main cities in Saudi Arabia. And we are a full service law firm handling corporate commercial matters, disputes. Um, foreign direct investment into the kingdom. Um, and of course, our family practice, high net worth individuals who are investing, obviously, both in kingdom and out of the kingdom. Fantastic. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, Hussein, perhaps you could introduce what you do with us. Certainly. Um, I am a co-head of the international arbitration practice at Withers. We are a full service uh, law firm headquartered in London, founded in 1896, 17 offices around the world. And we have a um, focus on the Middle East as part of a special interest group, both in terms of advising high net worth individuals, family offices and corporations on investments in the region, but also investments from the region uh, around the world into the UK and elsewhere. Delighted to be here. Thank you. And, and finally, uh, Mark Brooks. Mark, if you could introduce what you do. Thanks very much, David. I'm an educational consultant. And what that means, I work with families all across the world, advising them on the best British boarding school for their child. And I've just flown in from West Africa, where I've been for the last two weeks, helping families. And uh, my background is working in boarding schools as well. So I've worked in a number of boarding schools, got a, uh, an MBA on how parents choose an independent school. And recently I was recognised by the Department for Business Trade as an export champion for the work that I do as well. So 24-7, I'm working with families on boarding schools. Fantastic. Well, look, great to have you with us. Um, Amgad, just to come to you first, we read a lot in the press about the booming economy in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about how you see it and particularly the sectors that you see as most vibrant within the uh, the economy? Well, I think if we look at the kingdom in particular, it is, let's say, imposing its will on the map and really, you know, showing what it has to offer. Um, but even before it was in the news, you know, making large contracts for the Ronaldos and the Messis and the football and what have you, you know, we must always remember that it's always been approximately 80% of the Middle East GDP, even before. So while there was a lot of emphasis on Dubai and maybe some of the other um, jurisdictions, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia by far um, dwarfs the other, let's say, economies in the region um, through its GDP and scale and what have you. Now, they are starting to promote it, I would say, a lot better by having these large me mega projects and focusing on, you know, activities such as tourism, such as sport, and also really encouraging, putting forward policies that have encouraged and even maybe forced companies to establish 
their regional headquarters in the kingdom. Mm. So we are certainly seeing greater interest now than before. And the key to growth for those who are really serious about growing in country, as you're saying, is having substantial presence there on the ground, local entities, Absolutely. isn't it? I mean, perhaps you could you could tell us a little bit yeah. about how you help foreign companies who, who are serious about doing business in the kingdom. You know, one of the things, you know, historically, um, when we look around the region generally, in Saudi Arabia specifically, everyone had in their mind that these 5149 relationships that you needed to have a local partner and what have you. And, you know, the foreign investment regulator that is established today, which is the Ministry of Investment Saudi Arabia, was established in 2000, 2001. And from that point forward, we've seen a tremendous opening of the kingdom to mm -hmm. foreign direct investment, whereby foreign direct investment can actually open on their own in most cases um, without having a local partner. Now for you know many commercial reasons, it may make strategic sense to have a partner because you know a good partner who's cooperative and sharing the risk and the benefits and what have you can um, you know take you a long way, but it's not an absolute necessity like in the old regime. And we can see that has really encouraged a lot of foreign direct um, investment in the kingdom. And as part of that was, you know, the kingdom joining like the World Trade Organization, agreeing to various international treaties that actually required it to, you know, open up certain sectors. And then as the kingdom saw the benefits of opening the sector with companies operating in the kingdom, that it created tremendous employment opportunities and training opportunities for local Saudi nationals. It's just continued to expand on the notion of allowing foreign investors to operate on their own and, and, and with control over its in-kingdom business. Interesting. And um, do you see any particular jurisdictions as, as a source of the foreign investors? Are there parts of the world where you're getting more inquiries from coming to, to set up or it's it's very easily spread? Is it from Asia to the US? You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say if we look at, let's say, the top 50 economies around the world, whether it's, you know, within Asia, um, Europe, um, North America, um, and also the surrounding GCC countries, we are we are seeing more and more um, investment in a broad a range, whether it's you know consultancy companies or law firms and what have you, to large industrial manufacturing, to um, technology and even startups, you know venture capital and what have you that are um, tapping into the local um, Saudi Arabian startup scene with the the universities in the kingdom. And in terms of bringing key members of staff, if a business wants to send people into the, the local subsidiary there, I mean, how how easy is it to achieve mobility amongst people who want to come and, and Look, live? I think for key members, when you're talking about, let's say, you having a general manager or a chairman or people who's, who are sitting on the board of the legal entity, it becomes much easier to get them visas and what have you, because you can apply through these visas through the Ministry of Investment, which allows for greater ease in getting the visas. And then, you know, all investors, whether they are local investors, local Saudi companies, or foreign investors, each legal entity will be subject to Saudiization requirements. And these Saudiization requirements are requirements that more or less everyone needs to follow. And mm -hmm. so long as you know, the entity is compliant with hiring the requisite number of local nationals for its industry, then it becomes even easier to obtain visas and work permits for those non-Saudi nationals in addition to, let's say, the senior management. And in the financial sector, I mean, um, CAF, KAFD, King Abdullah Financial District is doing great work attracting Absolutely. businesses, isn't it? I mean, that for certain sectors, 
that and, and in the financial world, um, there's real infrastructure there in Riyadh, isn't there, for business? Exactly. And, and I would say also in terms of local talent, you have to remember that there are over 30 million people living in the kingdom. And which, let's say, for Middle Eastern standards and, and in particular GCC standards, it's quite a large country in terms of size and also the, the number of people that are living here. And most of the people living in the kingdom are predominantly Saudi Arabian nationals, right? Mm. And so, therefore, um, in the highly educated work, workforce, and we find that many of our clients are able to find a really good mix of bringing in team members from outside, in addition to um, finding the right talent locally um, for their business operations. And, and it, as you mentioned, is a geographically very large country. I mean, how, how do you see the opportunities spread? Is it focused around some of the key cities? Are there certain regions that are more economically active, or are all country, are all sort of regions participating in the? in the boom in the economy how, how well, do you see it spread fortunately or unfortunately we are seeing a major expansion in the riyadh region in particular and i say unfortunately because it takes a lot more time to get through riyadh traffic than it used to be however um i would say still the number one priority is riyadh and we're even seeing a lot of and there's the government is heavily emphasizing Riyadh as well. And we're seeing many people moving from places like Jeddah and Al Khobar and other, you know, parts of Saudi, especially the local Saudi nationals to come in and work in Riyadh. But on top of that, um, as we see the mega projects expanding and developing, I think you'll see a number of people, you know, leaving the concentrated cities of Riyadh, Jeddah and Al Khobar and, you know, starting to work in areas like, let's say, Neom or Red Sea and even in the south, because mm. the government is trying to create opportunities um, in other parts of the kingdom so that it is not only heavily concentrated in Riyadh. But certainly the action now is in, you know, there's the new regional headquarters requirement where the government is, is encouraging foreign investors to establish their regional headquarters in the kingdom and we are seeing that primarily these regional headquarters set up are being established in Riyadh. And and generally, I mean, the 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 travel position is 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 opening up, isn't it? In terms of now, you can get visa on arrival. There's also some I read some liberalisation planned around business visits as well. I mean, the tone of visitors coming into the country is very much positive and open, isn't it? And welcoming. When I visited Riyadh last in the last year, I found it. Very well. And we can see the infrastructure. I mean, if you look at, for example, the the airport in Riyadh, the expansion in in they will call it King Salman Airport, um, with the new airline of Riyadh Air, and um, the new airline in Neom. And so, when we are seeing now that it's becoming even easier to travel domestically, mm. and in addition to with the once Riyadh Air becomes up and running. Um, we'll see significant changes um, in terms of the ease of international travel between Saudi and, um, you know, the other countries. Um, and you're right. I mean, we, you know, five years ago, let's say, for example, we would always have client requests for us to create visas for them so that they, they can visit mm. the kingdom. And, you know, obviously, you know, within the past two years, significant changes in terms of ease of entering the country, in terms of, you know, let's say women being able to enter the country. Um, and people are coming here for, let's say, many of the sporting events. People would primarily come for business only or coming for religious purposes of Hajj and Umrah. So, for example, at the end of this month, we're having the boxing match of Tyson Fury yeah. and um, Francis Ngannou. And you'll see many of the people coming in from outside or the Formula One races and what have you, which, you know, even a couple of years ago, we really didn't see that much of that. Well, you mentioned that the sport is not to get distracted by the sporting industries because actually versus the overall economy, it's it, it's not a large part. But actually, it does give you visibility, isn't it? You are on the stage there. 
in, in terms of sport, whether it's in football or, or boxing or other other areas? I mean, do you think that, that the put drive into sport does have... Um, well, I think it's part of the them? whole tourism ecosystem, right? So, you know, now they're having... I'm not into golf, but they have a major golf tournament that's coming. They're having the Formula One races. They're having... They've had already several high-profile boxing matches. They just announced a UFC, the first UFC main event coming to Saudi. We've done a lot of work, for example, with the WWE. So when you look at it, um, we've have sponsoring marathon races. So when you look at it, let's say one each individual event, it may not mean much. However, when you build it all together, mm. and let's say the aggregate of the marginal gains of these events together, tying in with tourism as being one of the because i can tell you when these events are on the hotels are full you know and um you know it's i think it's part of the whole tourism ecosystem and um the legal market is changing locally i mean how do you how do you see the the change in the legal market and, and what you think that's going to mean as well for cooperation collaboration with um, foreign firms on legal matters? Absolutely. I mean, we are seeing just within, you know, the past 18 months, a doubling of the number of law firms that have entered the kingdom. And honestly, we are still an underserved market. You know, mm -hmm. we have to put in perspective that, you know, Saudi is a G20 country, right? And there should be 100 international law firms here, right? Mm -hmm. Um but the reality is we probably don't even have 20. So while the supply has increased, the demand is still there and there mm. will be demand um, and appetite for legal services. That's In addition to that, Please. the government was, it was very normal, let's say for the government to hire law firms that are based either outside of the kingdom or in the UK or in the US and what have you and starting in particular in 2024, there's been, um, and other consultancies besides legal consultancies, um, a push by the government that for government contracts to be dealing with those firms and entities that are having entities in the kingdom. And so that's encouraged a lot of firms that are dealing with government entities and quasi-government entities to actually set up in the kingdom. That's exciting. If I can just bring you in on that and the the change you see in the legal um, market in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia? Absolutely. I mean, one of the key things for cross-border investments and investors is um, the security of legal framework and the ability to have appropriate and neutral uh, fora for adjudicating disputes. And arbitration is um, paramount uh, among those options because it allows for uh, neutral uh, and flexible dispute resolution. And Saudi Arabia has really made you know, significant strides in, in this area in the last decade. So um, they've got a, a new arbitration uh, law uh, with um, various uh, advantages in terms of party autonomy and flexibility and basically supporting the arbitration process in Saudi Arabia and relating to Saudi parties. And the second development is um, in some way related to that, but it's uh, the enforcement law because that also facilitates the enforcement of arbitration awards in Saudi Arabia and in the court system, subject only to very limited exceptions. And the uh, cumulative effect of these two combined measures provides much greater degree of, um, uh, of security of flexibility for dispute resolution, um, which of course can facilitate the cross-border trade and, and investments that we're, we're starting to see. Thank you. And Amgad noted that the Saudi economy is 80% of the GCC. Is, as head of Middle East at Withers, do you see similar where the, there's, there's a good chunk of your client base are linked to um, key families and businesses in, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia? We do. And I mean, as a firm, we've always had a, a lot of, um, of Saudi uh, clients and, and family offices. Of course, Saudi Arabia is quite particular compared to many countries in the world in that I think it's something like 62% of the um, private businesses are at least uh, family-owned businesses. So that sits very well within Wither's historic private client focus and strengths. And we've advised a number of uh, very prominent individuals, families, institutions relating to Saudi Arabia over many years, but that is certainly increasing um, as 
uh, things uh, open up in terms of investment and trade flows. And in terms of the appetite for investing into different uh, types of um, investments uh, for these families, whether it's hotels, hospitality, um, tech, uh, pharmaceuticals, these are some of the areas that we've been advising, not just for the families on their own personal tax positions, but on global structures, taxation, joint ventures, and then the transactional work relating to those downstream investments. And we were chatting about the sports sector and how that is, while it's not doesn't move the dial in terms of the actual uh, the totality of the economy, is an interesting area. And do you see that also flowing towards the UK? I mean, obviously, there's lots of sports clubs that have received interest and in backing and investment from from key Saudi um, clients. So, what's your read on 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 that on the on the sports side and and uh, interest you see from there? No, absolutely. It's definitely relevant. We have a preeminent global um, sports practice. And so we see a lot um, of uh, activity in that sector uh, from investments from Saudi Arabia and elsewhere in the, in the region. Um, I mean, if one looks at the Saudi Arabian Public Investment Fund, for example, one of the 10 largest um, investment funds, sovereign wealth funds in the world, obviously their investment into Newcastle United, that acquisition is quite a significant uh, development, similarly uh, becoming the second largest shareholder, the PIF in Aston Martin, another significant development you know, uh, with, a, with a UK nexus. But more generally, we see a lot of activity in the sports sector and in, in other sectors. And just to consider in the last year, trade um, flows between the UK and Saudi Arabia has almost doubled. Um, mm -hmm. That gives you a sense, I think, of quite how much activity uh, there is um, at this time and, and looking forward. And, and just zeroing in on, on the family office market, I mean, and, and family office clients in the kingdom who are investing globally, I mean, how do you, how might you work with them? How do you find you get engaged by them? But there's a real variety. It can be everything from individuals who um, have assets in the UK, who want to acquire property here, who need taxation advice here, to working with a trusted advisor of many decades to a family, to full family offices and multifamily offices um, and advising more on also the downstream investment and structuring related issues on the corporate side. But certainly we are seeing um, significant uh, evolution in terms of uh, investment profiles and um, uh, families that have um, you know, historically been in the construction sector, for example, or infrastructure or oil and gas related, but increasingly also moving into other sectors. Amgad mentioned tourism, sports, tech, um, uh, healthcare. These are some of the sectors, real estate as well, globally. These are some of the sectors we've seen a lot of activity in, whether it's the UK, um, Switzerland, uh, the US, East Coast, West Coast, continental Europe, or in Asia. In all of these jurisdictions where we have offices, there's, there's quite a significant a line of activity and, and deal flow with, with families from Saudi Arabia. Thank you. I mean, Amgad, just for your perspective, I mean, how do you see the, the family office market or the internationalized family business, if you like, um, locally and how that's developing and improving learning? Well, I think it's developing when you see, let's say now, a lot of these family offices and, and the, the family businesses um, are into their second and third generation and so on. And so you're seeing a different thought process, um, whereas let's say the first generation were into creating a distribution or a factory or heavy industry. And then now you're seeing the younger generation wanting to get into more of venture capital and technology and startups and what have you, and to become, let's say, much more diversified, right? Um, both in kingdom, and out of kingdom, whereas I think Hussein rightly mentioned, you have a lot of, you know, the international real estate and the hotels and what have you, and you see the younger generation, okay, they are still involved in that, but also trying to um, get into, let's say, the newer, sexier areas where they can invest their money. Have you seen this shift firsthand, uh... A saying in terms of the next gen with different priorities, different interests, educated abroad, perhaps bringing ideas back into the core business that they're looking to be more innovative. Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. We, we're seeing that. Um, I mean, there are issues also of control, authority, of governance, of succession. These are all obviously, you know, complex and very uh, topical areas that arise 
with different degrees sometimes of sensitivity, including around confidentiality. But there there are definitely generational shifts that play out in the context of family businesses and what you know those at different levels, different generations want to want to be doing and where they want to be focusing and their way of of thinking about doing it. So those changes are very much are happening and they're and they're very live ones. Okay. And and perhaps I mean you're focused very much on disputes and helping clients resolve disputes. I mean what are some of the key triggers, particularly in that cross-border investment um, piece? Well, again, again, it sort of follows in a way the investment flows, which is historically having been very much around infrastructure, construction, energy-related investments, and therefore disputes in those sectors. Now we're seeing you know, a broadening in terms of the dispute resolution landscape. So there are more disputes in the joint venture space, more in terms of banking, finance, corporate commercial arrangements and trade. So, you know, for example, we're representing a Saudi Arabian company at the moment on a London seated arbitration against a company from uh, another jurisdiction um, in Asia, in East Asia, as it happened. Um, and this is not any of those more traditional sectors. So there's a broadening in terms of the mm. dispute resolution landscape, which in some way follows from um, the broadening in terms of the investment landscape. And obviously the UK GCC trade agreement, which is uh, in the process of negotiation and potentially conclusion, maybe as early as this year, again, this will facilitate the trade and investment flows. But with that will of course always come um, the need to, to address the cross-border disputes in an appropriate way that can facilitate, um, to facilitate the economic um, uh, interplay. Mm. I mean, Amgad, how, how do you see disputes in, in, in your practice? Is it something you get drawn in on and involved in a lot or or not so much? What... Yeah, I mean, you know, we've seen historically, if we look at, let's say, 20 years ago, you know, in, in many cases, the families would try to resolve their differences without going to court mm. or without. And in particular, when the, the patriarch is alive, and has control over things and is able to sort of deal with the situation without a formal, let's say, dispute resolution process, right? But mm. as investors or family members become more sophisticated, they are also seeking the advice of counsel. And we are seeing that, you know, many more of these family disputes are being played out before a formal dispute resolution process. And as a result, I think families are aware of this and they are trying to avoid it. And that's why when the patriarch is still around to try to make sure that the proper documentation is in place and the proper structure is in place to deal with the issues in advance mm. um, to avoid going through a formal dispute resolution process. Thank you. Hussain, I mean, how do you see that in terms of trying to mediate these family disputes behind closed doors? I, I would echo what Amgad says. I think there's a lot more focus on prevention and managing these things actively, but equally there's also a sort of professionalization in terms of the way of dealing with these sorts of disputes. Um, mm. And there's a preparedness where, you know, rights are at issue also to ensure that they're not um, somehow lost or, or curtailed. And I think that means also increasingly that there are more disputes coming from the region. And if we look at the statistics of the major international arbitration centers in London um, and in Paris, for example, the LCA, the ICC, we do see a notable and increasing proportion of the parties in their arbitrations do come from Saudi Arabia and from the region. Um, and so I think that's a trajectory that's likely to increase with this sort of professionalization of the dispute processes. We see also interesting developments like the establishment of the Saudi Center for Commercial Arbitration with greater flexibility inherent in uh, their framework for arbitration seated in Riyadh and Saudi Arabia, allowing also um, uh, lawyers admitted in other jurisdictions to appear in arbitrations there. So I think that this is something which is a part of um, you know, Saudi Arabia's sort of uh, more, if you like, um, uh, open legal approach for investments is to support that also with the arbitration uh, frameworks that are being being put in place. Fantastic, thank you. Well, Mark, just to bring you in, I mean, education is one of the UK's top exports. The brand of British education is well known 
globally. What's you're coming out to Riyadh and Dubai with us? Uh, in a couple of weeks' time. What, what's your perspective on Middle East and families and their, their views on the UK education system and brand? Yeah, there's a fa fa fascinating talk so far from Amgad and Hussein, and I'm really excited to be visiting Saudi and also to Dubai. And I think as they were speaking, what's really struck me is the growing uh, nations and education is fundamental. It's the foundation, the bedrock for those growing nations. And we were hearing about young people coming overseas, getting educated for universities and boarding schools and coming back to Saudi and, and other places as well. I, I think education has changed. It used to be the three R's of reading, writing and arithmetic. But as we were talking about the careers that Amgad and Hussein were giving examples of, the, there's five C's instead of three R's now. And that's critical thinking, creativity, communication, collaboration and character. And these five core skills to prepare young people for the 21st century. But there's been a real tradition of uh, families from the region and also expats from the region sending their children overseas to the UK for boarding schools in particular. And there are 1,700 students from the region studying in UK boarding schools at this very moment. Because as well, I mean, the sector, the UK boarding system has many different options, uh, combinations and permutations, doesn't it? So it, there's a real, you cover the, the whole of the UK, as it were, and the boarding um, and day school offerings. But perhaps you could set, set out for us a little bit more information about the breadth of education that's on offer from the UK that might appeal to families in the region. Yes, thanks, David. That's a great question. I, I think I work with about 150 different day schools and boarding schools, and I took 22 boarding schools overseas with me just last week. And what struck me again last week is there's a specialist school and a specialism for everybody. So I was talking with a parent this morning, in fact, whose son is very keen on football and wants to go to the top football school in the country or they could be interested in musical theatre, and there's a school which has specialisms in musical theatre, or hockey, or all manner of sports as well, or academics. I know um, Cardiff Sixth Form College, a school that was out with me, I was talking to them, and they have uh, students from Saudi who joined, especially because they're the top academic school in the country for A-level results. Mark seems to have just... Um... Dropped off there. Hopefully he will he will come back on. Um, but just in the meantime, until he gets back on, uh, Hussein, um, in terms of inbound investment into the UK, I mean, it's well known that families from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia like buying London property, but also the education is an important element, isn't it? Whether it's at the university level or or before. I mean, how, how do you sit with some of the key clients that you're dealing with? So the nexus with the UK is indeed a deep one and a broad one, um, and very often it involves property, it involves often education, school, um, or and or university, um, and increasingly also investments into more of the sorts of sectors that Amgad was indicating there's mm -hmm. an interest in from younger generations, whether that's, you know, on the VC side or uh, pharmaceuticals or tech areas where the UK and London um, are particularly uh, strong and afford opportunities for diversification um, and investments in a way that's probably, um, it's fair to say, less uh, familiar to previous generations of, of families. But I think Mark may be back on as thank well. Thank you. you back thank on, you. Mark. Sorry. Thank yeah. Thank you. Right, the line dropped. Uh, Hussein uh, carried the baton very <laughs> well for me just then, because I was just going to mention about different specialisms. There's not just specialisms in sport and music and drama and theatre and all of those areas, but specialisms in science and technology as well. The UK is the leader in education in um, STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering and maths. And the Saudi families are very skilled at those areas as well. So... And, and what kind of age do families from the region tend to access the system? What are the sort of entry points in, in the boarding system um, in the UK? 
Yeah, we have something called key stages, but basically the, the, the traditional time to join the UK boarding school system is age nine, uh, sorry, year nine, so age 13, or at GCSE, which is age 16, 17, or sixth form as well. And um, so they're, they're the kind of key entry points. So examinations for IGCSEs or A-levels or international baccalaureate. And, and how would you help, how um, would it help the children to prepare for university education in the UK or US having been through boarding school education, completed their A-levels perhaps in the UK? Well, it's, it's a proven fact that if you've studied in the UK at a boarding school system, it's easier to get into British universities because the preparation that you get in the UK is tailored for the university sector, whether that be in the UK or America universities as well. So there's a seamless pathway. And another factor is they get to know the universities, they write their personal statements, they go on visits. And, and some schools are based in university towns in Oxford mm. and Cambridge. And actually lecturers from the university take part in lectures in schools as well. So there's a real synergy between the UK school system and universities going on and a seamless pathway between the two. Thank you. I mean, Amgen, perhaps what, what's your perspective on, on the UK university and education system in general or on, and even the US? I mean, what, what's your perspective? Say, on... um, if we look at even at our firm and we look at even when our clients are looking to employ people, the average Saudi national recognizes that there is a huge advantage to having a degree from a place like the United Kingdom, right? Even in our firm or our clients, when they are looking for new hires and what have you, because it shows a level of discipline, it shows a level of commitment, it shows also a level of being able to do the work, right? Mm. And so there's a huge advantage um, in terms of getting um, a well, a good paying job or having a uh, starting your career off right um, by having that degree from abroad, and the parents realize that and they know mm. that, and so many of them are willing. You know, first of all, the government is providing scholarships to many of the students, right? Um, but even when the government is not providing scholarships to um, certain students, the parents recognize the huge advantage and they're willing to make that investment. Mm. Very, very interesting. And, and do you think it also helps them prepare in a family business setting to go and get some education abroad in order to come back more skilled with more ideas, perhaps more network even around international contacts? Does that factor, does that feature in the thinking at all? I mean, I think, I think it, it's, um, I think the, the family businesses are more concerned about competency, saying, okay, what yeah. is the best education for the next generation that is going to create a certain level of competence to continue running the business mm. right now the the crazy part is most of these family patriarchs are not educated right <laughs> <laughs> they're just smart business people but um but they're willing to invest that time and money because and also they're looking for the competency and quite frankly they're able to get that competency a lot of times outside Mm. And Mark, I mean, what, what's your perspective on the skills, the, the leadership, the character skills that the UK boarding system might provide to those international families coming over to study in the UK? Yeah, and no, I was thinking about Amgad's point. I think there's a real strength in diversity and in international context. So some schools um, in the UK have up to 70 different nationalities, and there's a real kind of rubbing shoulders with international students from around the world is really helpful. But I was also going to say, it's not just uh, competencies in the classroom, it's competencies beyond the classroom. And in the 21st century, it's being able to deal with success and failure equally. So you could be climbing the highest mountain in Wales over a weekend with the Duke of Edinburgh Awards team and working together and de defeating the kind of cold and snow. And that builds your character as much as kind of 
learning algebra and things in the classroom. And it, it's strength of character, one of those C's I mentioned, the final C, which is so important these days, resilience and kindness and the strength of character, which they learn in, in a boarding school system through what goes on outside of the classroom, as well as what goes on inside the classroom. And how do you find that schools help children acclimatise to being part of a boarding school system that where particularly where the family is not familiar with that as a cultural as a cultural thing? Have you had experience working with schools who help really go that extra mile to help people settle in and make sure they uh, feel at home and positive? Yes, I've worked in a lot of boarding schools on the senior leadership team, and I think the key is to keep them busy. So. Um, there's no time to stop and think. There's, there's house song, house competitions, weekend trips, uh, everything to keep them busy, um, and sports competitions and extra study. Um, you know, the complaint I get from parents is the child has forgotten about me. They're so busy they don't have time to ring home and just tell me how they're getting on. So the house parents have to encourage them. They don't forget to tell the parents you're having a great time and you're learning a lot. They, they want to know. So it's it's not homesickness. It's kind of uh, really kind of falling in love with the school after a few weeks and really kind of hitting the ground running. Fantastic. And I'm glad in terms of in terms of outbound investment from from clients in, in Saudi. I mean, there's so many good opportunities in country at the moment. Is it a higher benchmark now before investors actually look abroad for investment? Or what, what, what's your read on appetite for, I guess, foreign investment and diversification? Uh, yeah, I would say there, was, there will always be an appetite for foreign investment and diversification because there are just simply opportunities abroad mm. that are not offered in kingdom, right? In the same way, there are certain opportunities you know, in kingdoms that are not off offered abroad, right? And it's a part of the diversification. It's a part of the risk management. There, is, there are so many factors that are um, taken into consideration. But certainly, you know, these family offices, they're, number one, there's more of them. And number two, the ones that are successful are getting bigger and bigger, right? And so... They are. They will continue to look for, and we were seeing more activity in the um, investing abroad. Mm. And, and if they're looking for, say, technology stocks, I mean, I suppose the U.S. being the number one market for those kind of investments. I mean, where, 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 where might the U.K. fit in? I mean, I know many families in the kingdom like to have a property in London, or as as Hussein. I think, yeah, yeah, definitely but, the traditional investments. Yeah. You know, where number one, the U.K. remains. A, a jurisdiction that is that is heavily sought after. It has a very stable legal system. It has the infrastructure of, you know, the education, housing, um, the geographic location, mm. the history. And so it will always maintain, um, you know, its role in, in terms of even for those that may be investing let's say in the United States or elsewhere, definitely um, the United, the United, and even geographically, you know, it's only like what a six, six and a half hour flight effectively from Riyadh. So, you know, it's not very far. Um, and there's, there's been historical ties, very close and deep historical ties between, um, between the United Kingdom and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and, you know, mutual respect. And, you know, the Saudis, they trust that. And there's a there's a certain level of comfort in that. Mm. I mean, Hussein, obviously, that that plays into your uh, your themes and 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 um, the, the type of clients you're right, that those close historical ties are, are a very important part of business and trade flows. Absolutely. And, you know, decisions on business are often informed by historical ties as well. If people have a you know reason to be in a jurisdiction, the UK, for example, because they spend, you know, their summers and have property here and so on, then it informs the extent of interaction um, for potential investments and structures. And then there's a familiarity as well with, uh, you know, culture, the environment, language and so on. These things all play, you know, a part. Too. And of course, diversity and diversification, something that's been mentioned a few times, 
that's relevant as well. So it may not be that the entirety of an investment portfolio goes into you know investment in the UK, but it often can be you know an area of geographic and and, and sectoral uh, interest uh, for investors from from Saudi Arabia. Certainly, that's what we what we see. Because the technology sector here in the UK as well does have its niches, and 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 there are very good technology companies that that are here. I mean, do you, do you see in like fintech and technology? There's actually there's a great offering here in the UK for foreign investors, such we, as from the kingdom. We 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 very much do see that. I mean, on the sectoral side, you know, post COVID, we've seen significant appetite, increased appetite for investments in, I'd say, four areas in particular. There's tech. There's the more traditional, you know, real estate. Uh, there's um, the hotels and hospitality side. Um, and there's the you know sports uh, side as well. We've seen a lot of activity in all of those. You could add you know pharma as well more generally if you were going to you know segregate that out from tech, although you might have it subsumed in some context within. And and as part of this, obviously VC and how it interplays with different areas. But essentially, these areas have seen a lot of of, of growth um, and turbocharged in many respects. Um, I think you know in parallel with with COVID. And certainly from the Middle East, there's there's appetite in these areas. I mean, not exclusively, of course, still industrial manufacturing has its role and so on. But these areas have, have I think, you know, we've seen significant uh, growth and development in them. And we've got significant transactional practices on these areas as well as on the, on the private client side. And, and there's a lot of headwinds in the real estate market here in the UK, you know, with a, with a weaker currency, with changing habits in, say, the commercial property market, changes in residential. I mean... But I imagine colleagues in the real estate team are just as busy with clients looking opportunistically at prime assets or, you know, assets where they feel they're, they're getting a good deal. Are you seeing the real estate team as just as busy with um, with transactions? Certainly there's activity. I think, you know, it can depend on um, appreciation of um, value as well for mm. buyers and, and sellers. Um, at a time where obviously interest rates have increased, you know, quite considerably recently. So um, this is something that you know um, is always, of course, paramount. Um, you know, is the is the price right for the buyer and the seller? Um, but there are certainly opportunities, and there are certainly you know significant transactions that are continuing, um, notwithstanding you know that um, that environment. Thank you, and we're coming towards the end of this webinar now. Amgad, I'd just like to get your thoughts on on the growth path uh, of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the trajectory of the economy, going like a train right now. Do you see do you see the the growth uh, continuing to uh, to head on upwards as we move towards twenty thirty and Vision twenty thirty? Well, absolutely, and in particular, if we look at the price of petroleum, it's still a petroleum based economy in terms of where the investment is coming from and the spending by the government. So. Um, you know, the oil prices are not coming down anytime soon, at least let's say for Saudi standards, that makes it quite profitable and the ability for the kingdom to continue to invest. And, um, you know, and we see every day the government announcing new projects, new initiatives and what have you, the government and also the private sector, but primarily being led by the PIF and, um, you know, so we definitely see going into 2024 and 2025 and into 2030, um, you know, the continued growth. Thank you. And uh, Hussein, I mean, you travel to the country frequently. I mean, what kind of changes have you observed and, and what do you see of the growth path uh, as we go towards 2030? I think it's the it's the hard and the soft alongside each other. I mean, the infrastructure growth is really impressive, um, but it's also equally uh, important. I think the um, soft side, if you like, namely you know facilitation, visa access, um, and the changing you know shape of international travel and tourism in the country. So I think if you had either of those you'd have a significant development. But I think both in parallel makes it, you know, really quite, uh, really quite notable. Fantastic. And Mark, it's your first visit uh, to the Kingdom in November. Are you looking forward to coming to Riyadh, meeting people and talking about UK education with them? 
Yes, I'm really looking forward to it. And I'm also excited to be bringing a school with me called Copperfield School, who are based in Switzerland. They're a British-owned school based in Switzerland. And the, the, the logic there is, we, um, you talk about 2030, but in 2029, Saudi is hosting the Asian Winter Games. And Copperfield is a ski-in, ski-out school in Verbier. And they're coaching lots of students in skiing and they're talking to the Saudi authorities and others about coaching some of the students for the Asian Winter Games in Saudi. So it's all exciting times. Fantastic. I'm glad the Winter Games coming to town 2029 just shows you, you can do anything as a country, doesn't it? You know, when you put your mind to it. Yeah. Oh, sorry, just on mute there, I'm glad. Sorry. sorry. Um, absolutely. I think people would be surprised by the geographic complexity of the kingdom mm. where, you know, we're not, it's not one big desert, right? So, you know, I think Hussein mentioned earlier that he's going to Ebba. So he'll see the, the baboons and the forests and, and what have you running around. And then, you know, you have up North where you can actually ski and they're putting in the infrastructure for, for the ski and um, absolutely. And I think people will be surprised at sort of the geographic diversity that the kingdom has to offer. Wonderful. Well, look, thank you for joining me today. It's been an enlightening conversation and uh, we look forward to sharing this, but thank you uh, to my panel for joining me this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having.